gentlemen, and those currently negotiating a ceasefire with their digestive tracts after the last Taco Tuesday massacre, welcome back to the High Court of Tundra Tactical, where we deliver the ultimate judgment on firearms and their proud, sometimes delusional owners in the 2A community. Today, we wade through the swamp of shame, the dumpster fire of design disasters, and the black hole of ballistics blunders. It's time for the worst firearm fails in history. So sit back, prepare to get served a full course of cringe, and let's start the show. I probably broke my desk. I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. Alrighty, folks, let's journey back on to 1956 when Elvis smashed his way onto the American music scene with Heartbreak Hotel and famed gun designer Robert Hilberg gave us the Whitney Wolverine, a pistol with more style than sense it seems. It hit the market for $49.95, about $480 in today's money, or just a couple of Glock problem solvers with a few extra mags. First, something called the Whitney Wolverine kind of sounds like it should be more part of a Saturday morning cartoon lineup, not sitting in your gun safe. It was created by national treasure Robert Hilberg, you know, the guy who helped develop the M60 machine gun and the inexpensive insurgency shotguns for the US government to airdrop to the anti-communists fighting the Red Menace with more budget constraints than a college student living off of <gasps> instant ramen. Yep, that guy. <laughs> Does he look like a bitch? Hilberg must have been asking himself, what gun would George Jetson carry when he created the Wolverine? I mean, this gun screams space age. When I look at it, I just can't help but think, though, this 22 caliber uh, pistol is equivalent to a fedora that automatically tips itself and says milady just a bit too often. I have no doubt when the Wolverine attended gun high school, it got shoved into lockers by Rugers and Colts. <laughs> And for those picturing the Wolverine as the epitome of sleek retro futurism, well, let's uh, be real here. You're envisioning a gun conceived at a 1950s world fair by a designer who was high in his own supply of chrome paint. The designer may have thought that this would bring the space age to the shooting range, but the only thing space age about it is how it vacated the market at the speed of light. Have hyper on that thing. And what do we got on this thing? A Cuisinart? Now I know what you're thinking, but it's got that cool Flash Gordon futuristic look. Yeah, sure, if your definition of futuristic includes looking like a prop from a Star Wars parody adult movie. Hmm, the Adventures of Django Fat, P H A T, Intergalactic Bounty Hunter. By the way, you should move that video from your important tax documents folder on your PC. Go ahead and trust me on this one, bud. Whitney Wolverine, we judge you to be the mullet of the firearms world. Business in the concept, party in the design, and nowhere near practical in any situation that requires any form of seriousness. Actually, wait a second. Seriousness and practicality. Kind of like owning a CMMG. Hey, if you want something that will actually run and was made to standards, then you should check out CMMG and their new Mark 47 Descent, available in 16-inch and now 12.5-inch variants. Combined with these zeroed muzzle devices that come as standard, this is truly the next step in innovation for the fans of the 7.62x39 cartridge. If that's not your style, CMMG has something for everybody, from your standard ARs to 22 conversion kits and heck, even the 5.7 Banshee. CMMG has all your needs for quality guns to fit any role. So go click the link in the description below and get yourself an upgrade today. Oh yeah, don't forget to tell them Tundra sent you. Ah, the Dardic Trown. Because when the world clamored for more edges on their cartridges, David Dardic said, hold my slide rule. Patented in 54, Dardic's Triangle of Confusion, encased in the most psychedelic polymer since the lava lamp, promised to revolutionize the way we thought about jamming firearms. This cartridge would pair with an open top pistol, a design choice that screams, I don't just flirt with disaster, I bring it home to meet my parents. You just got jammed. 
Dardic looked at the smorgasbord of post-World War II arms development and thought, you know what this world needs? A gun that fires Dorito-shaped sadness. Hence, the Tround was born. Coming in colors more suited to marking ski slopes than loading into firearms, it ceased production faster than you can say public acceptance. What's that? Its brief resurgence under Project Salvo further proved that the only thing the government loves more than spending money on a bad idea is spending money on a bad idea twice. With chambers open like your mom after a box of white Zinfandel, the Dardic promised rapid reloading. Go ahead and see the previous joke about your mom. The Tround, it wasn't just challenging to load. It was like solving a Rubik's Cube while blindfolded. Every attempt to use it felt like inviting Pinhead over for a play date. You opened the magazine. We came. This thing turned loading ammo into a demonic puzzle where the prize was a malfunction. It wasn't just the Tround itself. Dardic's gun, with the allure of versatility that one reviewer charmingly likened to a six-armed monkey, flopped harder than a neighborhood pig roast in the Gaza Strip. Ugh. Brother, ugh. Okay, honestly, calling these firearms a commercial failure is kind of like saying the Titanic <laughs> had a minor buoyancy issue. Dardic Tround, we here at Tundra Tactical judge you to be the triangle peg in a world of round holes. A testament to the kind of innovation that leaves historians scratching their heads. May your triangular legacy serve as a cautionary tale. Not all who engineer are destined for greatness. Some are just destined to be trivia questions at a very niche pub quiz night that ends with me waking up next to the surprisingly tender local Sam Squamsh. It's Sam Squamsh, Ricky, and there's one right outside my fucking door right now. He's trying to get into my shed. Developed by Robert Manhart and Art Beale, I believe is how you pronounce his name, the gyrojet rifle was essentially the result of somebody saying, hey guys, you know how guns are all reliable and make sense for the most part? What if we changed all that? When introduced in the swinging 60s, it promised to shoot tiny little rockets. I mean, nothing says America like making a pistol or a rifle, I guess. That is essentially a miniature NASA launch every time you pull the trigger. I can see JFK asking Marilyn if she wants to see the rocket in his pants. Is it a pistol or a rifle or is it both? I think it's both, honestly. Because I thought this was supposed to be used in space. Wasn't that the uh, like the alternate design? They wanted to use it in space. Oh yeah, and then let's talk about this micro jet technology. I mean, the idea that the pressure is inside of the projectile, not the gun, sounds pretty neat. Until you, of course, realize the terrible muzzle velocity made it about as threatening as a strongly worded letter sent to your local homeowners association. The gyro jet's issues ran deeper than just slow moving ammo though. It had the accuracy of a weather forecast and the reliability of a 2 a.m. infomercial product. Whew. That one was spicy. Way blacker, so that oh, one yeah. went off in the gun, right? Maybe it did. Maybe no, no, dude, it's still there. It's in there. So it's we got a we got a squib. Jeremy's gonna shoot the other gun now. Did that just do the same thing? Just squib two guns in a row. That velocity did tend to increase the longer it burned, kind of akin to like a snail getting up to top speed if you give it enough time and encouragement. But at that point, your target was eligible for social security and was working as a Walmart greeter. Gyrojets, they're like the DeLorean of firearms, a covetable collector's item that's more nostalgia than function. With ammunition so expensive, it makes your wallet weep just thinking about it. I mean, sure, it's cool to say you own a rocket pistol until you actually try to fire it and realize you've got a better chance of hitting your target by throwing the dang thing at it. Rob and Art set out to defeat armor with their tiny little rocket rounds, but only ended up piercing the bubble of practicality. They designed this space age looking carbine, hoping the US Army would bite. Spoiler alert, they did not. Instead, they created a weapon where moist air turned their rocket fuel into sludge. Yeah, and the aiming? Well, it was about as accurate as a frat boy trying to hit a urinal on last call at St. Patrick's Day. So when people ask, why didn't the gyro jet take off? See what I did there? The answer is simple, because it barely took off from the barrel. Gyro jet, 
We judge that you aimed for the stars and ended up lodged in the ceiling tiles of obscurity. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up for a trip to the land of the rising sun where ambition meets procrastination in the curious case of Japan's M1 Garand ripoff. I want you to go ahead and picture this. World War II is blazing and Japan's semi-automatic rifle technology, well, it's about as developed as my high school love life. Non-existent. Wow. That brought me back for a second. Thank you there, writers. A whole lot of nothing. That was bad. Yeah, times have changed. Three years ago, I would have been a hero. Enter the Japanese Navy circa 1944 with a light bulb moment. Conversation went kind of like this. Uh, guys, <laughs> why don't we just clone the American M1 Garand? Genius, right? Wrong. Introducing Japan's Garand, the Type 4, some say Type 5 rifle, a weapon so close to greatness it could practically taste mwah, its sweet umami flavor, but it ended up like the rest of Japan tasting defeat instead. This rifle was kind of like the knockoff brand that promised to be just as good but falls apart the second you bring it home. Chambered in Japan's own Type 99 7.7 by 58 millimeter cartridge and rocking a 10 round magazine fed by five round stripper clips, it was the semi-automatic solution Japan desperately needed about four years too late. The Japanese Garand was kind of like that buddy who arrives at the tail end of a bash and just can't grasp why the place isn't hopping. It's decked out with an Arasaka style sling swivel and a front sight that seems to be made from a prize in the box of Lucky Charms. Let's not forget, by the way, the hilariously impractical aperture of a rear sight. I mean, aiming with this thing must have been like trying to thread a needle with your feet while blindfolded. By the time Japan got around to actually producing these marvels of desperation, the United States was knocking on the doorstep with a 20,000 ton rapid eviction notice. Today, the Japanese Garand, well, it's a collector's dream, a fascinating anomaly of war that serves as a testament to Japan's last minute Larry approach to semi-automatic innovation. It's the history lesson that we all need to prove that in the arms race of World War II, Japan, well, they decided to bring a knife to a gunfight. And it wasn't even like one of those good knives. What are they called? Like Gins Ginsu knives. Yeah, it wasn't a Ginsu knife. It's the most incredible knife offer ever. Here's how to order. Out of the ambitious goal of mass producing these rifles, only a hundred or so ever made it off the assembly line. Therefore, Japan's Garand, we judge you as the epitome of too little boy too late. You stand as the testament to the folly of imitation without innovation, a historical oddity that reminds us that in the arms race, time is everything. Enter the Shosha, the infamous worst gun in history. A title it wears as not a badge of shame, but more like a weird neon sign of infamy. It's named after Colonel Louis Shosha, and this was a French gamble during World War I, a punt that went about as sideways as a drunk on roller skates. With a production count soaring into the hundreds of thousands, it was less a testament to industrial efficiency and more a mass production of despair. In other words, it was very, very French. We give up. We surrender. We accept that this conflict has ended in your favor and we submit to you. French noises. Here was a weapon system that dreamed big but delivered little, embodying every possible design misstep with a sort of reckless abandon. Its crowning glory though, the half moon shaped magazine. That was about as robust and effective as the Maginot line. The trenches were no place for such a delicacy. The magazine's open air policy was an invitation for mud parties where the only thing getting slaughtered was effective fire.
Build as a light machine gun, the Shosha was about as light on reliability as it was on engineering sense. It might as well have been the first attempt to make a gun by somebody who'd only ever heard of them in passing before. Its select fire capability would have been considered innovative if, you know, the Shosha decided to actually fire. Or like the operator would be clearing jams like an overworked maitre d. Manufactured by Gladiator, a name that promised combat prowess, but delivered a performance more suited for a stage farce, the Shosha was a walking contradiction. Designed to be portable and fired from the hip because aiming was such a passe concept, it was setting the stage for future firearms design in the same way the Hindenburg inspired air travel. By the end of its service, the Shosha was so despised that replacing it with literally anything, stuff like a slingshot, maybe some harsh language, a firmly thrown baguette, it was all considered an upgrade. The closing act of its tragic opera was the final development of a fully enclosed magazine prototype, a feature that arrived about with the same tardiness as reinforcements in a lost battle. So here's to you, Shosha, a marvel of contrarian designs, a gun so profoundly bad that it became legendary. You are the yardstick of failure, a warning to designers everywhere that sometimes it's just better to head back to the drawing board. Hey, you know the French say saboner instead of subscribe? So, you know, saboner. How's it actually pronounced? Like sabonier? Hey, listen, I know it's pronounced saboni. So just calm down, y'all.